So we are still studying um, about God's will, how to discern God's will, and how to seek God's will out in our life. Um, today we're going to be picking up with question number 19, uh, but before that, uh, I'm going to give a quick overview and let's go ahead and and just pray pray real quick. Michael, will you go ahead and lead us in a word of prayer? Lord, we just uh, kind of be happy to tell your word and study it. Um, please help us to apply it to us. Uh, that we learn in the study of our lives. And in Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so a key thing that I want us to remember is that the attitude of our heart as we seek God's will is not my will, Lord, but your will be done. Because if we begin to seek God for selfish ambition, for for worldly things, God will not be pleased. And we will find ourselves so quickly straying from what God's will is actually in our life. We must understand that that our heart is deceitfully wicked, right? Who can know it? And the point that I want to make there is that if we allow our emotion and we allow our experience and and we build our life upon those things apart from God's word, um, we are deceived. We have to understand this. God is not a genie in a bottle. And his will will be difficult at times. That is guaranteed. We are called to suffer for the gospel. That's that's truth. We are called to pick up that cross and deny ourselves and follow where Jesus leads us. There are going to be times where God's will will be difficult. And so that's why our attitude and our heart must always be, let your will be done, Lord. I submit to you. I trust you. Lord, your will is perfect, good, and pleasing. And I want my life to have value. I want my life to bring you glory. So I surrender to you. Let your will be done. And on the other hand of that, we must understand that while God's will can be difficult and will come through hard times, God does love us. And God does desire to bless us But he'll never give us those things that get in the way of our relationship with him. And he'll never give us the things of this world that would lead us into sin. You see, God's always looking out for us. He does what he does have our best interest in mind. And a lot of the times those difficult things we go through conform us into the image of Christ. That's God's will for us. First and foremost, God's will is that we repent of our sin, that we put our trust In Jesus Christ for salvation, we come into a personal relationship with Him and we begin to walk with Him every day. Step by step, we live our daily life for Him. And then His will unfolds for our future. His plan comes to be in our life. But it's through that place of surrender. And it takes patience. It takes time. It takes trust. It takes obedience. It takes that heart that is devoted So what we need, what do we need to know God's will? What is it that we need to discern God's will? We need His Word. And how do we rightfully discern God's Word? What did James tell us to do? If we lack wisdom, we go to God and we ask for wisdom. And He gives to all without finding fault. What is the fault that that's mentioning? What do you think that's saying? Aren't we all sinners and we all have things that we are struggling with at times, right? So what's the fault, you think? Motive, that's right. So if we're just seeking after God to get what we want because we've come to think Jesus is just this person I can, I can go to and he's going to bless me, he's, he's my little buddy, He's the genie in the bottle, and and he'll grant my three wishes, right? That's the wrong motive. And God ain't going to listen to our prayers when we harbor sin in our heart and and when we have unconfessed sin in our lives. He ain't going to grant 
wisdom to those who just want to use it for their own selfish desires. Nor will his will come about in our life, in our personal life, when we disobey him and when we want what he gives more than we desire God himself. We must understand that. So first and foremost, God's will is that we would just come to know him, right? That we would receive salvation by repenting of our sins, putting our trust in Christ, coming into that personal relationship, and we begin to live our life for him. We take up our cross, we deny ourselves, and we cry out to him, and we say, Lord, not my will, but let your will be done. We submit, we trust, we have patience, and we obey. We say, Lord, give your wisdom, give your servant the wisdom to know your will and the strength and the grace I need to walk in your will. For your glory, Lord, for your purpose, God's will will always lead us to a pure and holy life. If you're questioning a decision, you can ask yourself, does this bring me closer to God? Does this bring God glory? Does this lead me into a pure and holy life? Because not everything that comes across our path in life is from God. We talked about this in a different lesson, but let's refresh our memory. Here, here's an example. Someone gets a job opportunity to get paid a lot more money. And now they, now they can come into this place of being financially secure. They can pay off their house and they can provide for their family. But in doing so, they have to sacrifice going to church. They have to sacrifice time with their family, time that they sit down and teach their children and, and be with their family and love them and, and train their children in the ways of the Lord. See, that ain't from God. And we can discern that because if... If something is coming into our life that isn't leading us into, into a pure and holy living and it isn't leading us into a closer devotion to God, it's not from God. Very simple, right? But we still need that wisdom because there's a lot we don't know. And we need that humility. We need to be humble. If we truly want God's will to be done, patience, humility, Trust, submission. And you know, my point is this, and this is why I've said this so many times through, these, through the lessons. Many people today are deceived into thinking that God's desire, our will, is to give them what they want. You know, God's will will always be in accordance to God's word, and you're not going to separate those two. You're not going to be able to walk in God's will for your life apart from the study and the submission and the devotion to God's word. Here's an instance of that. Say you're single and you begin to, to ask God, who should I marry? But then God's word says clearly, do not marry an unbeliever. But you never read God's word to see that, right? So that that's just a very clear thing. And, and that there's so many different cases we could go through. We just, what, what I, my point that I want to get is we can't separate God's will from God's word. We cannot separate God's will from God's word. We are going to, to get that direction we need to clearly see God's will for our life through the devotion and study and submission to God's word. Daily getting into God's word. Daily getting into prayer. And being patient. And with always with that heart attitude. Not my will, Lord, but let your will be done. Okay, so that's a pretty good intro and a summary of kind of the things we've gone over. This next step into this study of God's will is we're going to be looking directly at some of those verses where it says directly, this is God's will for you. So in our worksheet, we're on number 19. And... And so, question number 19, and we're also going to be looking at Proverbs chapter 19, verses 20 through 21. And this verse says, Listen to advice and accept instructions, instruction, and in the end you will be wise. Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. At the end of the day, we may desire a good thing, but it doesn't mean it's God's will for us. Does that make sense? 
we have to have that place of humility. And we have to be willing to sacrifice every desire, every dream, and totally just submit. And, and we, lay our, we can lay our requests before the Lord. He desires that. From an honest and pure and humble heart, we say, Lord, I desire to do this. I desire to do that. Is this your will? And Lord, if it's not, just, just help me to see that. It's important to stay humble, to be submissive, to be in prayer, to be in God's word. And here's another thing is we're going and we're seeking God's will as we're making hard decisions or just what to do in life. Um, is we pay attention to the advice from other believers. You know, God can send an open door and he can prevent us from going in the wrong direction if we stay submissive to him. And at the end of the day, we can know that it's always God's will that, per that will prevail and that should give us great comfort. If we're truly seeking God's will, that should really comfort our hearts because if we're truly humble and submissive and we really want God's will, we, we may... You know, we're, we're fearful. Okay, I don't want to make the wrong decisions, and I don't want to do what's displeasing to God. But this verse, the second part of it, many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. So, so that should give us assurance, especially if we're worried about making the wrong decision. And I would say if there is a decision that you're making, and it's not something just directly stated in God's Word, be patient. Seek the counsel from other trusted believers, preferably, you know, those who are more mature, and, and be humble and be willing to accept no. Um, this is when we'll really start to see God's will is when we lay our desires before him, but we're willing to accept no, because we trust him that much. Lord, you have a purpose, you have a plan, you have a will, and I want to walk in it. It doesn't matter. I Submit every dream and desire, and I lay it all at your feet. And, and that's why it says, in view of God's mercy, to present yourself as a living sacrifice. All right, so number 19. A fool despises instructions, but the wise listen to advice. There be times where it may be a little tempting, we're not going to get the answer that we want. And if we're a fool, we're going to despise instruction. Maybe someone else in the church says, you know, maybe one day, but I don't think you're ready for that. But if you keep at it, and if you keep seeking God, and you begin to mature, then one day you can step into that. Right? God's will isn't just this instant thing. And, and the overall is that we're conformed into the image of Christ, not that we go and do particular things. That's part of God's will. But he's looking to change our hearts, that our hearts would be devoted, our hearts would be pure, that our lives would be holy, that we would trust him, have faith in him, surrender to him, obey him, that we would worship him and love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. It takes time to be transformed by God's word. It takes time for God's will to come about in our life, and he'll test us. We'll go through times of testing. Number 20, God calls us to be, what do you think the answer is for that? Uh, patient. Patient. To wait upon Him, to trust in Him, even when it seems like He isn't moving in our life. There will be times that that is our reality. We have to be patient and trust Him through the times where it doesn't seem like God's moving, through the times where it seems like the answer is no, through the times where we just don't know, right? If you're unsure of something, just be patient. Trust God and wait upon Him. He does have a plan and a will for each of our lives, but it may not look the way that we think. God does, not move, God does not move according to our timing, but He does things in His perfect timing. He doesn't do it the way we think He should do it because His ways are higher than our ways. And His thoughts are not our thoughts. Our role as we seek God's will is to keep faith 
and trust him and be patient and be obedient. What time do you got, Michael? On my watch? Yeah. 10.36. Okay, let me know when it's about 10.50 because we have to practice. All right. So as we seek God's will with our whole heart, trusting in his timing, being patient, We pray, humble, submissive. We seek godly counsel from those whom we can trust. We get into God's word. So today, we're finally there at at the first verse where it says, this is God's will. And let's read 1 Peter 2.15. It says, for it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. What do you think this verse is saying to us? God is saying, this is my will. This is my will right here. That by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. What's one thing that that you think that verse is just directly stating? According to this verse right here, it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. This is what it's saying. That as the people of God, we should live such a good life that unbelievers, though they accuse us of doing wrong, though they accuse us that that Jesus isn't God and that what we believe isn't true, they would see a life filled with faith and love and good deeds. Right, that our life should be a living testimony to our faith. And they have nothing to say at this point. They can't say, oh, you know, Michael claims to believe this, but lives this way. No, we're living such a good life that they have nothing to say. They're ignorant because they don't know God. They're ignorant because they don't, they don't know God's word. And, and they're confused about what, what is right and what is wrong, as with the whole unbelieving world that our life would be a living testament to Jesus Christ, that he's living on the inside, that he is the master of our lives, that we represent him in everything that we do and that we shine that light. Let's look at our next question. Matthew 5.16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Right? We're to be bold and stand and live. We are not ashamed. We are not fearful. We know that Christ is with us, that he is our strength, that he is our protector. Like it says, don't fear man, but fear God. Right? So that's the point. It's God's will that our life is a living testament to our faith. And what is our faith? That Jesus Christ died for sinners. He lived that perfect life. He gave himself upon the cross. By his sacrifice, we are made right with God. He rose again. He defeated death. And by faith in him, we overcome. By faith in what he did, we are saved. And our life should bear witness to what we believe. That's God's will. That we live a good life. A holy life. A pure life. Right? Daily confessing and forsaking our sins. Daily submitting ourselves. Daily picking up that cross. Those who don't know God, those who don't read the Bible, are those who will read our lives. Does that make sense? People watch people. And when it comes out you're a follower of Christ, every little thing you do will instantly be judged at a higher standard. I've seen it in my own life. Oh, that person says they believe in Jesus. And see, that's why it says that a lot of false teachers who are greedy and who make up stories just to you know, manipulate the naive, that they bring the way of faith into disrepute for that very reason. People look at them and like, 
this is what it means to follow Christ and they're flopping around on the floor and they're making up stories about going to heaven and going to hell and seeing Jesus and seeing angels and they're up on stage dancing on money. Yeah, this is reality. That's what I mean. People who don't know God are going to be reading your life. How you act towards others matter. And it's just simple that it's God's will that we live a, a life that represents our faith. Right, that represents Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, bringing Him glory, shining a light, doing what is right in God's eyes. As it says, do your best to live at peace with everyone. But at the same time, it says that we obey God rather than man. That's why you're never going to see God's will for your life apart from God's Word. If you're not getting into God's Word, I guarantee you, you're missing God's will. We don't want to do anything that, number 22, what's the answer? We don't want to do anything that, what do you think the answer is? Hinders the gospel. We don't want to live in a way that hinders the gospel. We don't want to do things that prevents others from coming to Christ. So, to be humble, to examine ourselves. No, we're not going to do this perfectly. God does give us grace, but only to those who have a repentant heart, who have a humble heart, and who truly, with all their heart, seek God's will. So, the context of, of our passage, 1 Peter 2.15, is it carries the command to be submissive and obedient to rulers and authorities. So if we're not submissive to authority in our life, this is going to hinder the gospel. You're telling me that someone that follows Jesus is disrespectful, they pop off at the mouth, and they don't do what those who are over them tell them to do? They're not humble at all. This person's prideful. He's arrogant. He despises authority. God's word is clear that as his followers, we are to be submissive to everyone. Those who are in authority over us, those who are even under us, that we would be submissive with the heart of Christ, a heart of a servant. We're not above doing the lowest of tasks. We're not above taking orders from people that shouldn't even be ordering us around. Remember, it was Christ who humbled himself to be obedient, even to be obedient to death on a cross. And then therefore God exalted him, right? That's what it says. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. He who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who is humbled will be exalted. Romans 13 gives us that command of being submissive to governing authorities and that no authority except that which has been established is by God. Right? God is sovereign over the nations. God is sovereign over authorities. He's the ultimate authority. So when we deny authority in our life, we deny God. That's what we learn in Romans 13. You, you want to not be submissive to the officer? You're, you're denying God's authority. To the teacher, to your boss, to your parents, to whoever, you are in disobedience to God's authority because he establishes every authority by his hand, and when we do that, we hinder the gospel. How much time we got? So remember, number 23, every authority we find in our lives has been placed there by God's sovereign uh, will. will. You got it. And therefore, if we're rebellious, rebellious against those authorities, we are rebelling, rebelling against God. So that's the thing. <clears throat> Let me read Ephesians chapter 6. Should have had this marked. All right, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5 through 7. This is talking about slaves and, and masters. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart, serving wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord and not men. That is just beautiful. 
And if there's anyone who's getting a little caught up with the slaves and masters thing, you see, here's the thing is that you can't have social reform in the world without a change of heart. You can make all the laws and, and do all these things, but at the end of the day, our hearts are deceitfully wicked, and only in Christ are you a new creation and you get a new heart. So it's not about changing all of that when everybody's heart is still unbelieving and hardened to their sin and denying God. But it's when slaves come to faith in Christ, those masters come to faith in Christ, their heart is changed, and then our relation toward one another changes, right? We, be, we have a heart of love now. So that's the point. This can refer to jobs, right? That we work for people, our earthly masters, those who are above us. We should serve them with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, right? That we would make the gospel of Christ attractive. We don't want to do anything that hinders the gospel. We need to obey them to win their favor so that we can tell them about Christ because we're a slave to Christ and we need to do the will of God from our hearts and that we serve them wholeheartedly because we're serving the Lord and not men. Does that make sense? That is the heart of Christ right there, the heart of a servant. Humility, love, bearing the burden of one another. Do we love those who are difficult? That's the question. So, there's a, there's a lot of background information that I want to give on 1 Peter chapter 2.15, but this is our takeaway today, that we would live a life that is upright, that is holy, being in some submission to God's will, surrendering our life to Him. And this is a choice as believers we got to make every day. That's why Jesus said, pick up your cross daily. Every day we got to wake up and make that choice. Lord, today I submit to you. Lord, I trust you. Lord, I desire your will to be done in my life with my whole heart, even if the answer is no, even if your will is difficult. Lord, because I'm not deserving of the mercy, so I present myself to you as a living sacrifice. As I look upon the cross, that you would die for the worst of sinners. Because I acknowledge the sin in my life, Lord, and I turn from it, and I turn to you, and I walk with you this day. As Joshua said, you know, choose for this day whom you will serve. You're going to serve Bell, or you're going to serve the Lord. You're going to serve the world and money. Are you going to serve your own desires or are you going to lay all that at the feet of Christ and say, Lord, let your will be done today. I submit myself to you. I submit myself to those authorities above me and I don't want to do anything to hinder the gospel, but I want to let my light shine so that you receive glory from my life. So next week we're going to go over some of the historical context because there's a lot we can learn. We're going to, we're going to talk about... Uh, Nero and how brutal that fellow was and, and how the early followers of Christ really went through some persecution. Once again, showing that God's will always isn't just this little fluffy thing. He's calling true men and women of God to pick up their cross, to suffer for the sake of the gospel, to lay down their life Right? Jesus laid down his life for us. We should live our life for him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we praise you and we thank you that you are mindful of us, that you love us, that you have a will for our life. Give us the wisdom to see that will. Give us the strength to walk in that will. And let everything in our life be done for your glory. Lord, keep us from temptation. Help us not to stray from you, but keep our hearts pure that we would live a holy life, Lord. Forgive us and cleanse us from our sins. Help us to have that heart of a servant and have that heart of humility. Let your will be done in our lives, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.